All right, everybody, welcome and thank you for joining us here. I'm uh, uh, my name is Ryan with Rising Tide Explorers, and we got a really cool um, presentation for you guys today. Um, we're talking about mangroves, um, so there's a lot to learn. Um, a lot of us see these trees all the time, uh, whether we're kayaking, boating, or just around uh, this area of the world here. So um, we'll jump right into it, and what I'm going to do is share my screen with you guys all righty okay so just some housekeeping stuff to start um, feel free to type into the chat box um, Q&A um, raise your hand we have a little uh, hand raising function here um, if you see anything weird like black squares let me know and i'll make sure i fix it right away um and we'll have a great time talking about um the estuary and the mangroves in our backyard so this is rising tide explorers and again my name is ryan young if you missed it um we have been in operation since 2016 and uh, we serve naples and marco island and we're the exclusive ecotour providers for the rookery bay reserve um, and I will tell you more about that if I can figure out how to advance my slides here. There we go. Okay. So for those of you with us last time, you saw a presentation by Captain Janine and Savannah called Discover Rookery Bay. That told you a lot about the Rookery Bay Reserve, um, how it came to be, what they do at the reserve, and um, all the other great things that they do over there. It was an awesome presentation. So thanks for coming back again if you saw that one. And we are the exclusive ecotour providers for Rookery Bay. Like I said, founded in 2016 by a bunch of nerds who wanted to raise the bar of ecotourism in the region by providing the most qualified guide staff around um, in that we're all local biologists. So every one of our guides actively does or has recently done research, many of them with publications or their names in publications. Uh, most of them have master's degrees or are pursuing it. Um, so it's a really, really amazing crew. Um, I can't speak highly enough of, of our team here. They are not only a blast, but um, some of the smartest people I know. So to explore the estuaries with them is unlike anything else. And we like to say we're not your average tour company. You know, this isn't a tourist trap. This is a unique group of individuals who enjoy sharing their passion with other people. Um, and this is what we spend our life studying and doing. And it's just an honor and a privilege for us to be able to share that with with you guys and with as many as we can so although we may not be operating our tours like we usually do we are doing rentals and we have a mission and that's to share this amazing place with you guys and um, what makes us really different is not only that we're biologists but for all the tours and activities that we do we're uh dollars go back to support the friends of rookery bay our nonprofit partner so um, we are their exclusive ego tour provider and we value giving back to the place that allows us to be in business. I mean, it's, it is a real special place. And for us to be able to contribute to its conservation and protection for the rest of time is, uh, is a really special thing to us. And when you go out on tours or rent with us, not only are you supporting the Rookery Bay Reserve, but you're supporting the science community. Because all of us, you know, nobody gets into science for the money. Um, and, uh, you know, we pay people that are science people to come out and share that stuff with you guys. And uh, it gives them an opportunity to, to live a little more comfortably and continue doing the research that they're so passionate about. So we have boat tours, rentals, kayak tours. We're starting our own research. And uh, you can see some of the certifications uh, that we have right here, including uh, certified kayaking instructors, first aid. Um, we like to make sure that you guys know that you're paddling with somebody who's qualified, trained, and safe because you can literally be out there with just about anybody. And that's um, what we make an effort to do here at Rising Tide. So a uh, quick overview. I won't I talk to you guys about it last time, but um, Rising Tide Explorers Home Edition is kind of our virtual campaign that we're running here. Explorers Academy, if your kids are running around your house and driving you crazy, or you know somebody, refer them to Explorers Academy. We got tons of cool activities going on. Crosswords, word searches, wildlife scavenger hunts, stuff they can do on their own but also science projects where we have video instruction that's fun and educational and they can earn points to earn weekly badges with each week there's a new theme and they work towards their junior biologist badge with Rising Tide Explorers and um, they get to sew it on their backpack and feel real cool at school. 
Battle of the Bay. This is really picking up. And the updates here is that we've extended voting for the round of 32 for another week. Uh, we're still coming out with our sportscast videos, so make sure to give those a watch. Give them a like, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and uh, get involved. Every vote is a chance to win a boat tour, kayak trip, kayak rentals, rising tide gear like this hat or this 50 UPF fishing shirt right here. Um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, we were on the news last night. Thank you, Allison Ray of NBC2 for sharing Battle of the Bay with everybody. But we're having a blast with it, so get involved. And then, of course, the Knowledge Board, which are our virtual presentations such as this one. Uh, next week, we have uh, Sarah Norris coming to uh, present on her sea turtle work with the Rookery Bay Reserve. Um, so we're doing a lot of sea turtle themed stuff next week and it should be great. So um, that's her right there at the bottom right. You can find the links to register um, on our website at risingtidefl.com slash knowledge. Here's Battle of the Bay, the brackets. A um, lot of good matchups here. The horse conch has a lot of, I'm, I'm betting on the horse conch, but uh, you guys make your own decisions. Um, all right, Explorers Academy, there's the junior biologist badge. And let's get right into it. So um, again, my name is Ryan Young. Um, I have a master's in environmental science from FGCU. Uh, I lived in Florida since about 2005, I think that's what that says. Yeah, <laughs> you don't remember sometimes. Uh, I've been an outdoorsman my whole life, uh, an Eagle Scout, and I worked at Course Brew Swamp Sanctuary for a while, Rookery Bay Reserve as a sea turtle intern, worked on policy, um, and a lot of other uh, fun things that I was able to get involved with there. And, um, and now, uh, then I worked for DEP uh, out of Fort Myers, doing a lot of water quality and uh, plant community and insect community work. And now um, I help run Rising Tide Explorers with the rest of the team. Uh, I'm also a certified interpretive guide with the National Association of interpretation that's a mouthful a master naturalist and i have decent jokes so i've hurt uh, so hopefully you'll get some of those today um, but let's get into it so we're here to talk about our backyard why it looks the way it does what makes our area so unique and i love this image right here this is one of my favorite images i think it's kind of a cross-section of florida habitats and a lot of people don't realize that florida's natural systems are based on elevation where water will sit, where water will accumulate, will determine your whole entire plant community and what wildlife you might find there. So if you go all the way to the right, you have your pine uplands, you get into your cypress habitat, your wet prairies, your marshes, and eventually we get down um, to the mangroves that we're here to talk about today. So um, Collier County, a lot of us, uh, probably a lot of you are from Collier County. If not, you uh, may have visited. Um, I don't know where everybody's from on this, but um, this is us right here, the southern tip of Florida on the west coast. We are one of the largest counties east of the Mississippi, second largest in Florida, and we're twice the size of Rhode Island, which is completely crazy. Um, bigger than the state of Delaware even. So in terms of counties, you're talking about a, a really large county here. Um, so this is our backyard, and what I think is the coolest part about Collier County is if you look at this map, this is a land use map for Collier, and um, it has different colors to represent the different land uses around. So, you know, there's single family houses, there's water, there's preserve, there's estate, multifamily, commercial, all that stuff. But if you look at Collier, look at all the green in there. Collier County is about 24% of it is developable ever. So we're talking about a humongous county where 75% of it, give or take, is protected and preserved in perpetuity. Um, and it all starts right here in the Rookery Bay Reserve, which is really cool. So it's 2,300 square miles, largest county in Florida for land area, 34 miles of beaches, um, which everybody loves so much, 307 square miles of water, and all this protected land only 27% has developed. Sorry, I got the numbers a little off there. But how much of this have you actually seen? You know, we live in a spectacular place. And a lot of people, when they come here, they think of these things. Um, you know, the, the weather, for one, it's beautiful, obviously. But, um, you know, there's gated communities, there's golf courses, there's condos, there's Fifth Avenue, um, there's the beaches, of course. So people come here for a variety of reasons. And um, this is typically what people think of when they think of Florida, when they're planning their vacations. But uh, this is my fake guy that I made up. His name's Joe Schmo. He's commenting on Facebook here. And he can't wait to get to Marco Island so he can go to the beach. 
and he hopes he doesn't get eaten by an alligator. What he doesn't know is that alligators have no interest in him. Um, but uh, he's about to head down to Florida, one of the most ecologically unique places on planet Earth. So uh, we've got some news for you, Joe. Uh, you can't see Florida from a lounge chair. If you've ever seen our trailers, it says that huge on the back of the trailers. Uh, we like to shame everybody into getting out on the kayaks with us. So, you know, while you're sitting by the pool or lounging on the beach, there's more stuff to see. There's tons more stuff to see. And this is some of it right here. How beautiful is all of this? So go beyond the beach is what we always say. We got this, the beautiful cypress habitat. We got the mangroves. We got the wet prairies and the cypress domes, um, the marshes, oyster beds, uplands. You know, there's endless opportunity to see some really beautiful spots, not a couple of miles out of uh, downtown. It's right here. So there's Joe Schmo, and uh, he's got to know that there's much more to see here. So we got a lot to offer, and this is just a list of some of the, the different habitat types and, and types of environments we have here in Southwest Florida. Beaches, obviously, everybody knows that. We got cypress swamps, marshes, uplands, tropical hardwood hammocks, upland scrub, dunes, rivers, streams, springs, reefs, wet prairies, hydric pine flatwoods, and mangrove forests and estuaries, which is really what we're here to talk about today. Um, we could do presentations for days on all these other things because we love them so much, but we're gonna focus on what's right here in our backyard in Collier County, and that's the estuary. So um, these pictures, all of them were taken on our kayaking trips. Um, so we find all kinds of strange wildlife. We do our sunset bird rookery tour, which is absolutely beautiful, never gets old. Um, some of these are contenders in Battle of the Bay. The polka dotted batfish here on the right is doing very well right now. So is the banded tulip that's on the left. Um, then there's the horse conch on the bottom right eating a lightning whelk, which is pretty impressive. You got a giant hermit crab down in the bottom center. They get about 19 inches in length. They're enormous. Very cool. Um, the, the broadcast for invertebrates is coming out uh, tonight, so keep your eyes out for that. The top is a mangrove root crab, which is actually kind of a rarity that we've been seeing more often uh, since Irma. Kind of strange, and I'm hoping we look into it a little more. So those of you who were with us um, two days ago learned about an estuary and what it is. Those of you who weren't, um, I can go over it for you just real quickly. So um, what is an estuary? If you're going to make a t-shirt about it, it would say where the rivers meet the sea. You have a mixture of fresh water and salt water that are coming together to make brackish water. And the word estuary, uh, this is kind of neat. I love the etymology, the kind of background of where the words came from. Um, and aestus is a Latin word, and it means tide or billowing movement. And estuarium is marsh or channel slash a place reached by the tide. So the word comes from its Latin roots, meaning tidal, basically, because estuaries are typically tidal areas. Um, so history of estuaries in Southwest Florida. Now we're going to really get into it. Um, this is kind of setting the groundwork for why we have the types of habitats we do on the coasts here in Southwest Florida, and then we'll really get into it. So about 120,000 years ago was the last interglacial period, which means it was in between two ice ages. And if you look at this map down here um, in the bottom left, this one is 160 uh, to two, 23 million years ago. So quite some time ago. And during that time, most of Florida was underwater. It was a shallow tropic sea. And um, if you could see on this map on the bottom right, it has the Georgia Seaway. So where the panhandle is today, that's where the Gulf Stream used to go. And that really blocked a lot of that uh, quartz that comes down through the uh, Mississippi River Delta. And that's what formed our white sand beaches eventually. But back at this time, water was kind of blocking that sand from even getting down here. So the majority of what Florida was back then, most, mostly underwater, was built from uh, the, the remains of crustaceans and things. All your, um, all your snails and clams and things that break down and form biogenous sand, that kind of helped form that limestone bedrock that Florida is today. And, um, but the Floridian Plateau, uh, let's see here, 120,000 years ago, Florida was smaller. So we got 160 million years ago, then we have 120,000 years ago. This map shows kind of what it probably looked like back then. Uh, we would be totally underwater, but some of the peninsula stands there. Um, so then we move on just a little bit to 10 to 12,000 years ago, which was the peak of the last ice age. 
very different place back then. Uh, and this is a really neat map. I love this one. So the Florida Plateau. And Florida's a plateau, believe it or not. Um, and if you look at this map, that yellow dotted line is what Florida looked like during that time. And on the west coast of Florida, um, the coast went about 100 miles further out. Uh, if you've ever been deep sea fishing off the west coast of Florida, you, I'm talking about deep sea fishing, like pelagics, not like your 60 foot deep reefs that are 20 miles off the coast. You got to go 90 miles out to reach the West Florida escarpment. And if you look at this little graph at the bottom here, you see where Naples is. And then you go way out and you reach the West Florida escarpment, which drops down to the abyssal plain of the Gulf of Mexico there. So if you can imagine the coast being that much farther out, 100 miles, the water in the Gulf of Mexico sat below the lip of that continental shelf and Florida had cliff-like coastlines. Really difficult to imagine being that it looks so different now, but um, that created a whole nother kind of environment. It was a arid, flat, grassy plain. That's what Florida was. We had mammoths, we had giant armadillos, um, all kinds of weird Pleistocene era wildlife that lived here. And that's about when people started moving down into the area chasing after that big game. Um, and then it wasn't until about four to 6,000 years ago, as the ice age ended, things started warming, sea levels were rising. If you can imagine, it came up over the lip of that continental shelf and filled that large flat shelf pretty quickly to form the Florida that we know today. Um, so the Everglades and the coastal estuaries of Southwest Florida are about four to 6,000 years old. And when you're thinking about geologic time, that's not that old, that is very new. Um, so we're in a pretty young place if you think about it. So this is what our estuaries are today. Um, this aerial is right off of Shell Island Road um, where the Rookery Bay Field Station is. This is where we launch our boat tours and where we launch our Heart of the Rookery Bay kayak tours and our Sunset Bird Rookery trip. Um, so that's the mangroves. You also have oyster beds are another component of estuaries and here's a bunch of American oyster catchers uh, feeding. They're there, uh, you know, in the winter time, they're some of the coolest birds ever. Um, and then you got seagrass beds is also another component of estuaries in the area. So um, this is a little breakdown of where estuaries are around Florida and different kind of preserve and protected areas. So this is the DEP's Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection. And you can see a lot of these areas in blue and yellow. So we have aquatic preserves all around the state. We have three national estuarine research reserves, Rookery Bay uh, being one down here. Then you have Apalachicola and uh, Guatano Matanzas, which is up by uh, St. Augustine up there. So all of these places are made up of mangroves, salt marshes, oyster reefs, seagrasses, uh, barrier islands like Key Waden that we have here in Naples. Um, and what makes, but the question is what makes Southwest Florida so unique? You know, it, it, this place is not the same as the rest of Florida. Um, so this, this is really neat. Um, this is a climate map. Oh, I think I just got a chat here. Let me check it out. Do you have a pointer? Okay, yeah, uh, I will work on using this pointer a little bit better here. I think you can see it. Let me know if you can see my mouse here. Um, I can actually annotate too, this is pretty cool. Okay, so climate map of the world. So when you're looking at this map, this map kind of breaks down the different types of climates all around the world. Um, so that would be like rainforest or savanna or different kinds of um, habitats or climate regimes is really what we call them. And the one I want you to look at here is the green. So there's a couple different shades of green, but if you look at the United States here, we got a lot of orange um, and reddish colors. Look at the southern tip of Florida and I'll circle it right here, right there. That is green. So that is pretty unique in that Southwest Florida is the only place in the U.S. that has that kind of habitat. Oh, now I'm stuck on annotate. How do I undo? Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to advance this here. Um, okay, yeah, there we go. We got an arrow. How about that? Okay, so the climate map of the world shows Southwest Florida has a different climate regime than anywhere else in the U.S., so this is not something that people realize all the time. So we define this type of habitat as a tropical wet, dry savanna. Um, so we have our climate here in Southwest Florida is most similar 
to Southeast Asia, the Amazon, and the jungles of Central Africa, which is kind of wild when you think about it. I mean, even if you go up towards Tampa, it's not quite the same. But here at the southern tip, that's kind of what uh, defines us. So here's another one that just shows a close-up view of Florida. This is a Copen Geiger climate zone map. Um, that's what they call these maps. And you can see that most of Florida is humid subtropical. Um, and that word subtropical is pretty important. Um, and then right here in Naples, we are tropical savanna. Then over on the East Coast, you have tropical monsoon and even tropical rainforest, believe it or not, up by Jupiter there. So although when you're driving around Jupiter, you're not thinking, wow, look at this tropical rainforest, the pattern of weather um, that defines the climate that they have there is basically the same as a tropical rainforest in terms of rain frequency and intensity um, and how that moves through the seasons. So very, very interesting and very unique. Um, and being tropical down here in the southern tip of Florida, uh, one of the things that makes our botanical garden so unique is that it supports plants from the equatorial region of the planet, where most botanical gardens in the U.S. can't do that. Um, so go, go check out the Naples Botanical Gardens if you can, because it's pretty incredible. Um, and here's just a bigger map. It's kind of fuzzy, but this highlights the tropical wet, dry savannas around the country, and I know you can't really see it, but the southern tip of Florida right there also has some blue on it. So this kind of just highlights um, the similarities around the world here. So our unique climate regime. Oh, this is the best. Okay, so um, this right here is a picture that to me kind of defines uh, our, our climate here in Southwest Florida where we have our extreme wet and dry seasons. And what you're looking at here is a cypress dome. If you've ever seen one of these before, or you're driving across Alligator Alley, you're looking through the in the distance and you see these bumps. Uh, they kind of look like little mountains or hills or something, but in reality, it's trees. And um, cypress trees, the largest and oldest of the cypress are going to be in the center of a cypress dome. And that's typically the deepest part of it, too. Um, and as they grow, they drop their needles, which turn the water very acidic, which kind of eats away at the limestone bedrock makes it a little deeper, a little wetter, and allows for more mangroves to keep colonizing that same area. Sorry, cypress, I call them mangroves. Um, and you know, this is flooded in the winter and bone dry like it is right now uh, around this time of year. So we have very unique seasonal changes in that it's extremely dry right now and all through the winter. And then we're knocking on the door of summertime where we're gonna have our afternoon rains every single day. So our climate here is governed, all the habitats are governed by water, fire and elevation um, in that cypress is going to be low and deep and you move up and you get into this wet prairie right here which is too wet for pines and too dry for cypress so you have these really unique ecotones here in florida where one habitat shifts to another based on that wet dry climate regime there um, this picture in the bottom right is of corkscrew swamp sanctuary if you've ever been there this is like when you're coming oh out from Lettuce Lakes and you're about to make the trip back to the center right there and you emerge from the cypress and they stop so abruptly and you get into this wet prairie and then all of a sudden you have an abrupt change into a pine forest or an upland uh, area and that's what you don't realize is you're walking uphill when you're going back to the learning center. It's just inches that make the difference but that's going to define where water is going to flow and where it's going to sit so the cypress are nice and wet the wet prairie is a little too dry for the cypress, a little too wet for the pines, and then you move over and you get to the pines. So you may have witnessed or encountered these types of uh, ecotones or habitat changes and not realize uh, that elevation is what's governing where these things will be. Uh, so it's kind of neat. Next time you go to Corkscrew, keep that in mind because it's really cool to think about when you're walking through there. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So the estuary, that's what we're talking about today, right? So this is just a cool diagram of how estuaries work. They are one of the most biologically productive places on the planet, uh, more so than even coral reefs, meaning there's just more volume of life here. And like Savannah mentioned uh, two days ago on Discover Rookery Bay, about 70 to 80% of all the catch uh, in the Gulf of Mexico relies on the estuary for at least one portion of its life. So you can see you have rainfall upstream where the freshwater is moving into estuarine systems and that's what kind of feeds the system the nutrients um, and things like plankton plant life they need those nutrients to thrive and survive and they are in turn a food source for all these other little things like the crab the shrimp the small fish 
the, um, the salt marsh grass, the sea grasses, and then as you move out, you get your larger fish, your oyster beds, um, all kinds of things like that. So it's kind of an ebb and flow of the tides um, bringing nutrients out from the upstream and bringing that uh, marine life and salt water in from the Gulf of Mexico. So it makes for this really dynamic uh, meeting of two different worlds, which is pretty neat. So what does our unique climate mean for estuaries uh, in Southwest Florida? Mangroves. So this is the little rising tide logo here, but it is a mangrove. Um, it's so iconic and um, we talk about it all the time. So we figured we'd honor it by making it our logo here. Um, so this map shows you where you can find mangrove forests in Florida. And uh, some people don't realize that mangroves don't even go all the way up the peninsula. They stop right where this map, uh, the red, R stands for red, uh, W stands for white right here, B for black. So coming up the west coast, red and white mangroves go up to about Cedar Key and they get smaller and smaller and smaller and then it becomes salt marsh because it's too cold for these trees up there. And on the east coast, it's up here by Ponce de Leon Inlet, kind of just north of Cape Canaveral. You get the line of the reds and the whites and the blacks go just a little bit further north um, than that. So let's see here. Oh, mangroves. Yep, that's what we're talking about. All right. So global distribution of, of mangroves. This is where you can find other mangrove ecosystems all around the planet. So obviously here in Florida, you get some uh, scattered around the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and then uh, if you look at this chart on the bottom, it says mangrove species with the color bar. Um, the dark blue is one to two different species, and then it goes up all the way to 41 to 47. There are about 54 different species of mangroves all around the world, um, give or take. You know, scientists like to change things all the time. But if you look out in the um, South Pacific there, Southeast Asia, they have a huge diversity of mangroves over there. Um, and it, it, I wrote, do you look, does this look familiar? Because if you remember those climate maps we were looking at, this is very similar to that. Um, all that green all around the world are the same spots that also can support mangrove ecosystems due to the tropical climate there. Uh, so these are the flooded forests of Southwest Florida. Um, and we have a couple different flooded forests. Um, on the left here actually is uh, my wedding, uh, which we got married out at Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary and it was epically gorgeous. Um, this is a cool amphitheater. That's kind of a secret spot back there that I've been going to for years. And um, that's the cypress forest. And then on the right here, you have your mangrove forest. So maybe you've been to both of these, maybe you've been to one or none, but I want you to think about the last time you walked around a cypress forest. When you're looking around, I mean, you can see in this picture, looking around here, how many different kinds of plants do you see in a cypress forest, which is also a flooded forest like the mangrove forest. So just in this picture here, we got cypress. We got some strangler figs right here on this big cypress. You got ferns down here. I know there's a pond apple somewhere around here. We saw some orchids. There's some resurrection fern. We could talk about cypress plants forever because there's a ton of them. But on the right, we have mangrove forest. If you've ever been out in one of these, if you've been on a tour with us, how many types of plants do you see out there in the mangrove forest? I'll just let it cook for a minute. Three. That's it, three. We got red, white, and black mangroves, that's it. So, so what gives? You got two flooded forests. One has a ton of diversity, the other one doesn't. So being that they're kind of the same thing, what makes them so different? So that's just something to think about um, as we move forward. So mangroves in general, we're gonna talk about them a little bit. The reason you don't have the diversity in a mangrove forest is because of the type of water that is there. It's brackish, salty. So try watering your garden at home with salt water and you're not gonna have to garden much longer because you're gonna wipe out all your plants very quickly. Um, but mangroves are especially adapted for this unique area, um, the estuary. So I'm gonna give you some terms to kind of mull over so that all of this is put into context as we move through and get real science-y um, on the mangroves because they are just absolutely amazing. So ecology is uh, what I spent most of my science career studying, and that's the interaction of uh, organisms and their environment, or living and non-living things. Um, and then niche or niche, tomato, tomato, um, is a multi-dimensional space in which an organism is able to persist 
where the dimensions are individual environmental conditions and resources that meet its needs. So that's really complicated. A guy named uh, Hutchinson uh, defined that term, uh, famous ecologist. But um, a niche, you know, if you're talking about business, uh, a niche market, you know, you're targeting a specific audience to, um, to buy your product. So a niche is the kind of the role that something plays in its environment and how it fills that role and the adaptations that it has to survive uh, in its own specific way to avoid competition as much as possible. Um, so ecological species concept, this was uh, by Mar. This means uh, organisms need to find their own place in the natural world. A set of characteristics, uh, usually genetically based, that give it an advantage over its competitors and specialization that uh, define that species niche. So this is, I mean, I relate this to us a lot, you know, as people, we got to find our own place in the world too. You get, you get a, a career, uh, you find what you're good at and um, you know, that's how you make a living. So that's kind of what uh, mayor is saying right here um, in that this is how things get their own little niche. And then biological species concept is a group of natural populations whose members can all breed together to produce offspring that are fur fully fertile. So what that means is that two species, um, you know, if you can breed and produce viable offspring, then you're the same species. But then you have something like um, a mule. You, you breed a horse with a donkey, who are two different species. They can produce offspring because they're similar enough, but their offspring cannot then reproduce. They are totally sterile, which means that they're different species, even though they can um, interbreed. Um, so that's pretty unique, and that will come into play later. So just remember um, what a species is. Um, competition, exclusion, and resource competition. So species are competing for stuff out in the estuary. And um, if they're competing for the same resources, they got to adapt and change in ways to avoid that competition and survive. You know, there's only so much of something out there. So they got to be good at what they do. Um, just like all of us, right? You want to try to be the best at what you do. Uh, so moving on here, it's enough vocab. So we have three different species of mangroves in Florida. So these are different species. Remember the ecological species concept. Um, they don't produce viable offspring together. So these are the three that we have. You may have seen them around. So we have the red mangrove and that one has the crazy roots. So it's pretty iconic in that that's the only one with the drop in the prop roots and you can see them kind of dropping down from the branches. Um, and then it's got these leathery green leaves, pretty dark green. And then we move over to the black mangrove. And that one uh, is usually a little taller, dark, smooth bark. And the leaves kind of have the sage color to them. And they often have these little spikes around the base, which we'll talk about a little later. Um, so that one's recognizable because of the dark, smooth bark and those sage colored leaves that are pointy and a little bit smaller than the red mangrove. And then you move over to the white mangrove here. This one has rounded oval shaped leaves that are often a little paler green, slightly flimsier looking. Um, and they have a rough bark, kind of like that of an oak tree. And they usually grow pretty tall. And um, so the rough light colored bark and the rounded um, paler green leaves, that's what is the giveaway for the white mangrove. And like I said, I'm a nerd about this etymology stuff. So I like these Latin names. Rhizophora mangle is the red mangrove, which translates roughly to tangled roots from Latin. So pretty clever how they name these things. Avicennia germanans also is Latin based. And that roughly translates to grows out of a box. And if you ever see a sapling of a black mangrove, it looks like a little square lima bean with a stick coming out of it. So I thought that was clever. And then Laguncularia racemosa is the white mangrove. And that roughly translates to flask-like. And if you ever see the sapling of a white mangrove, it looks like a little teardrop, kind of like a flask. Um, so pretty unique. I'm always afraid I'm going to discover something and not be clever enough to come up with a cool Latin name like that. But uh, I don't think I have much to worry about. Um, all right, here we go. So this uh, is King Philip right here. So we're talking about different species. These are the three different species of mangroves. And there's something very, very strange about them. Um, so, you know, they're all called mangroves, right? So you'd think that they're the same thing. They're absolutely not. In fact, they're not even in the same family. And to put that in perspective, we got to talk to King Philip here. So King Philip came over for good spaghetti. Um, that's how you remember this. 
but it's the order of how we classify living things. So it goes kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Um, so um, now you'll never forget that. But that's King Philip. Have him over for good spaghetti, and you'll always remember how to classify living things. So uh, being in different families is something really crazy. These three mangroves are not related to each other at all. So if, to put it into perspective, oak trees are in a family, pines are in a family, walnuts are in a family. Mangroves are in three different families, at least the ones we have here. So um, calling all these three trees mangroves is kind of like calling an oak tree and a pine tree the same thing. And who would ever do that? You just wouldn't, right? They're so extremely different. So are these mangroves, but you don't think that first. So uh, we're gonna talk about why that is. So why do you call them all mangroves? It makes no sense, right? There are several things that make these mangroves similar. And two, uh, so three things I like to mention, two of those three things actually define them as mangroves. And these are some clues here as to what those things are. Um, so it's not genetics that define mangroves as we know them, it's characteristics. That's a bad joke, don't worry about that one. Okay, oh, sorry for the sound coming in here. All right, so similar similarity number one, what makes these mangroves so similar? Well, saturation, they're growing out of the water. So it's not a defining characteristic of them, but it is something that makes them similar. So where do they grow? They grow in a ton of water and they have some adaptations that help them survive in these saturated environments. Now, like we said, cypress forests are also flooded forests, but cypress aren't mangroves. So um, cypress have adaptations to deal with the water and these are the mangrove adaptations. So um, two of them that are really cool, the red mangrove here, you can see on these uh, prop roots that are coming off the tree, there's all these little white dots all over the place. These things are called lenticels. And lenticels are pores that allow the tree to breathe essentially through the bark um, on roots that sit even above the water line. So um, pretty cool that they can breathe through their skin basically. Um, that's a unique adaptation as far as trees go. And then over here, you see some black mangroves and all these spikes coming out around the base, like I mentioned earlier. Those things are called pneumatophores, and they are essentially little snorkels. So if you think about the word pneumatic um, or pneumatophore, they, um, like a pneumatic nail gun, it's air powered, right? So these snorkels allow the tree to reach up above the low oxygen soil and even the water line at low tides, so they can breathe regardless of being in all this water all the time. So um, pretty impressive. And uh, it's cool to see these. If you've ever been near a mangrove forest and seen all these, a lot of people think they're little trees. They're not, they're all snorkels. Sometimes they call them dead man's fingers, uh, which is, I think is pretty hilarious. They say that it's the pirates that used to live in Florida and they're reaching up to get you. Um, they won't though, so don't worry. Um, sorry guys, I'm just trying to get this sound off of my phone here. Okay. Cool. All right. So moving on. That's similarity number one, but not what makes it a mangrove. Now we're going to get into the other stuff. Similarity number two. This is the first thing that makes a mangrove a mangrove, and it's that they're salt tolerant, which is very, very unique and cool, especially for a tree. So uh, what kind of water do mangroves usually grow in? They grow in salty water. It's brackish in the estuary, right? That mixture of fresh and salt. So a pretty strange place for a plant to grow because most plants don't like salt, but they've adapted ways to deal with it. And there's two different ways that mangroves can tolerate and deal with salt. The red mangrove does it its own way. It's called an excluder. And um, that means that it's able to pull fresh water right up out of the salt water and leave all the salt behind. So it's pretty impressive that they've created, they don't use much energy to do this, they have a low energy reverse osmosis desalination system. So if anybody here can figure out how to do that as good as the mangroves do, let me know. Uh, we'll go into business together. <laughs> well, uh, you can visit me at my castle on the beach. But um, no, this is, uh, it's really cool. And this diagram here shows um, kind of how it works. So osmosis is when you have a solution on two sides of a membrane and typically, uh, it will try to balance itself. So say you're sitting in a bathtub for hours or the pool and your fingers start to prune up. The inter inside of your body has a higher salt content than the water that you're sitting in. So water will actually push into your body 
um, to try to balance that gradient. And that's why your fingers plump up um, because you're, you're sucking in water to try to balance the gradient. So essentially the red mangroves, what should be happening if you follow the rules of osmosis is the internal content of the tree is less salty than the water outside of it. So water should technically be pushing out of the tree the whole time, um, which would not be a very good deal for that mangrove. But it's adapted the ability to pull water against the grain of osmosis through a membrane that will, that will keep the salt out. And it uses capillary action and even something called evapotranspiration, which is when water evaporates directly from the leaves of the tree to create that negative pressure system, pull water through the membrane, leave the salt behind, and have as much fresh water as they want to. So really, really impressive um, by the red mangrove there. The white and the black mangroves do it almost the opposite way, kind of more similar to what we do. They're called extruders. And there's a quiz at the end and you can't leave the webinar until you get all the answers right. Um, no, I'm just kidding, <laughs> but um, uh, more vocab words, I know. But an extruder, the white and the black mangroves are both extruders. And that means they suck up the water with the salt and then get rid of it somehow. So you can see in this picture on the bottom right here, um, if you look at closely at a black mangrove leaf, you'll see salt crystals all over the surface. Um, and that's where they get rid of it, is on the surface of the leaf there. Um, back in the day, the settlers used to wrap their fish in black mangrove leaves because it helped preserve them. Um, and if you were to take a bunch of these leaves, mix it with fresh water, boil it down, you get purified table salt. Um, the tree's processing it all for you. You wouldn't want to take a scoop of estuary water and boil it down to get salt. There's a bunch of other stuff going on in there. But this is a good source uh, for salt here. So that's how they do it. The white mangroves are similar. Um, we're still learning more about the white mangroves, but they have these microscopic hair-like structures on the leaf surface that fill up with salt and burst to get rid of it. It's too small to really notice, see, or taste, but um, that's the little salt explosions going on all the time to get rid of the salt for the white mangrove there. So pretty unique and cool adaptation, but there's one more that I think is probably the weirdest and one of the coolest, and that's number three. It's vivipary. So the definition of a mangrove is a salt-tolerant viviparous tree. So I don't know if you've heard the word viviparous before. Usually I have people right in front of me and I like to quiz everybody. But um, since I'm just talking to you now, uh, vivipary, you got to break down the word again. Let's go to the Latin roots. Uh, vivi or vive, vivir. If you ever heard any of those words, you know, you run in the street and you yell vive. If you might've heard it before. It means to live, right? And then Paris, the second half of that word, means bearing. So if you smash it together, viviparous means live bearing, um, which is very strange when you're thinking about a tree. So essentially what that means is that mangroves give live birth. So I'll, I'll help get those weird images out of your head right now because I'm sure you're imagining some pretty disturbing things. <laughs> but um, they have this adaptation so that they can survive in the estuary. Sorry, I got uh, White mangroves do have pneumatophores. Yes, both black and white. Um, so black mangroves are more slender and long. Uh, white mangroves are shorter and they're kind of lumpy. They look almost like mushrooms coming up out of the ground. So both white and black mangroves do have pneumatophores. Red mangroves do not, they have the lenticils. Um, so thanks for that question. Um, where again are the cilia to extrude, extrude the salt? So cilia might not be the right term for the white mangrove and how they are um, extruders, but the leaf surface have these little hair-like structures. So similar to cilia in the shape of them, um, but that's where they get rid of the salt. They fill them up and they burst. Um, at least that's what the current uh, data says. So um, here we have uh, some of these things. You might have seen these floating around in the estuary, these long, slender, uh, green bean looking things washed up on the beach. A lot of kids call them pens and they're right in the sand with them. What they don't realize is that is a mangrove sapling. It's not a seed, it's not a fruit, it's not a pod. That's a full blown red mangrove tree. It just doesn't have roots or leaves yet. Um, so pretty cool in that you could be walking along the beach and you could pick up a tree in your hand um, that just doesn't look quite like a tree yet. So if you look on top of it, this little brown thing that looks like an acorn, that's the fruit of the red mangrove. So essentially what's happening, just to put it into perspective, is a, picture an apple tree, for example. Um, an apple tree 
is something that everybody knows. Um, oh, there we go. So an apple tree will grow, it'll flower, it'll fruit, right? And then the fruit falls, the seeds spread or disperse, and you get little apple trees all over the place. That's typically how it works for most fruiting trees. If it were a mangrove, it would be a little bit different. So it would grow, it would flower, it would fruit, and before that fruit ever falls from the tree, no seed dispersal involved in this whole process, the brand new genetically independent tree starts growing right out of the bottom of the fruit. And you can really see that on the red mangrove here. There's the fruit. So imagine an apple hanging from an apple tree with the trunk of the brand new tree growing right out the bottom. That's essentially what's happening. Um, so eventually when these get to be about 12 inches long, they'll fall off, they'll float in the water and they'll try to find their own place to live. Um, the red mangrove propagules here, propagule is the proper term for a mangrove sapling because that's how they propagate. Um, and these can float for up to 12 months looking for a good place to live. Um, if they float for any longer than that, they might start to rot and break down, but usually they'll get caught up in an oyster bed, maybe the roots of other mangroves. They'll set some root and uh, start to pop leaves out the top. So the one on the left here is the red mangrove propagule. The one in the middle here is the propagule of the black mangrove. Remember we said Avicennia germinans is, grows out of a box. These are kind of square and lima bean-like. And then you have your flask-like white mangrove, um, Ligoncularia racemosa. And you'll see these uh, around in the estuary. And right now, actually, on our YouTube channel, we're getting ready to post it next week while, when we push out more Explorers Academy uh, activities. We have a how to grow your own mangrove science project. You can grow these at home, which is pretty cool. So if you find a propagule washed up on the beach, um, you don't wanna pick one that's rooted um, or pick one off a tree. It's probably, if it's washed up on the beach or floating around the water, you're okay to take one of those home. And um, if you watch that instructional video, it'll tell you how to take a little container, put some uh, substrate of some kind in it, fill it up with water, and you can watch a mangrove grow right on your lanai. Um, and it's good in summer because it keeps it full for you. Um, so that's pretty neat. So a salt tolerant viviparous tree, there's a little baby there because all of these are mangrove babies. <laughs> this guy's pretty amazed at uh, how cool the mangroves are right now. Just look at them. Okay, so what is a mangrove then? A salt tolerant viviparous tree. Um, so uh, when I say that, I, I always call mangrove the platypus of the plant world which is kind of a weird thing to say. I mean, what a weird critter, look at this. Mangroves are equally as weird as platypus because platypus are mammals just like us, right? Mammals are viviparous, we give live birth. Not the platypus, that's an egg-laying mammal. Them, uh, echidnas, and a handful of other weirdos called monotremes are egg-laying mammals. They're different and opposite from all the rest of us, right? Mangroves are that way for the plant world. They're different and opposite from everybody else. They just reproduce in this really unique, crazy way. And that's baby Groot right there, which is a live little tree. Uh, I just thought that was pretty funny. Um, so there's 54 species of mangroves worldwide belonging to 16 different families. So here we have three mangroves, red, white, and black. A lot of them around the world are named after colors, uh, which is not very creative, but um, they belong to 16 different families. So there are mangroves that are more closely related. Many of them are in the same family as the red mangrove around the world. But here they belong to three distinctly different families. Um, so that just gives you the rundown of mangroves around the world. So why do mangroves matter anyway? You may have seen this cool video um, on the Discover Rookery Bay presentation with Captain Janine and Savannah just the other day, but uh, they do an incredible amount of stuff here in Southwest Florida which we didn't realize back in the day, which is how a lot of this coastal development happened. But when they did, now they protect mangroves to a level where you can't even trim them in your own yard if, if you uh, don't have a permit for it. So super important that they provide habitat. Remember we said about 80% of the catch in the Gulf of Mexico relies on the estuary for a portion of its life. The mangroves provide habitat for all those little critters. If I was a baby fish, you know I'd be in the roots of the mangroves because I don't want to be gobbled up by somebody bigger than me, and they can't necessarily fit in those roots. So that's a really good deal for me. They're island builders and coastal engineers. They help form uh, what the coast looks like. And red mangroves, once they take root, they drop their own leaves in their roots, they catch sediment as it floats by, and they actually accumulate and build land, which, which in turn make it more suitable for white and black mangroves, and they kind of form the whole entire coast here. 
Uh, blue carbon, they sequester a lot of carbon. Red mangroves are very, very productive. In fact, they can drop two to three times their entire leaf mass into the water in one year. So if you're from up north, imagine fall coming two or three times a year. You might have moved here a long time ago just because you don't like raking so much. Here they're falling in the water, but uh, very, very efficient at sequestering and capturing carbon and then feeding the estuary uh, this nutrition source. So highly productive um, and storm protection. If we didn't have these mangroves here, when Irma came through, we probably would have been in a lot rougher shape. Uh, I actually live, where I'm at right now, just on the, the north side of the Rookery Bay Reserve, and I have miles of mangroves between me and the coast, and I'm very fortunate for it because it can slow down storm surge and reduce its impacts. It breaks up wind really well. Like today was a little windy day. We had some renters go out, and they were just fine because they were able to hide in the mangrove tunnels where it's calm all the time. So it's, it's really a nice uh, place to paddle. And then economics. I mean, if you're thinking about 80% of the catch growing up in these places, that's what we eat. That's what we fish for. That's why people come here. Uh, Savannah said something great on the Discover Rookery Bay presentation and that, you know, just a tarpon, which relies on the estuary to grow up and feed, people travel from all over the world just to catch one. So, you know, they're renting cars, booking hotels, plane flights, buying food, eating at restaurants, going on amazing kayak tours with Rising Tide Explorers um, just to, you know, go catch a tarpon. So that's one small minuscule example of the economic impact that mangroves have and how positive that is for us down here. And of course, recreation and tourism, ecotourism, um, that's the name of the game. That's what we do. Um, so Southwest Florida's mangrove coast. If you haven't seen that documentary uh, on the Rookery Bear Reserve, go watch it. I have one sentence in it, very famous. Um, so it is the third largest contiguous mangrove system on the planet. And here in this yellow line, as you might have learned on the last presentation, is the Rookery Bay Reserve, 110,000 acres of pristine, amazing mangrove ecosystem that goes right through into the 10,000 islands here. Um, so really, really cool that we have this here. And that's the Rookery Bay National Estuary and Research Reserve, which then butts up against the 10,000 Islands National Wildlife Refuge, which if you look at these um, weird squiggly lines up here, the, the, the areas that are above the mean high tide line right in this area is the 10,000 Islands National Wildlife Refuge. And then in addition to that, we go right up to the edge of Everglades National Park right here, which is another huge, expansive, protected mangrove system. Um, so lots of great stuff here. We have a Stero Bay Aquatic Preserve up in uh, Estero there. Nice seagrass beds, really great place. And there's more. I mean, we're just talking about the coastal areas here. You also have the Picayune Strand. You got the Big Cypress, the Panther Refuge, Collier Seminole. You know, the list goes on. It's over 2 million acres of protected wild South Florida. Um, and the mangroves being one portion of that. So it's, it's really, really cool. So how do you go out and explore places like this? You know, mangroves can be confusing. Uh, there's no mountains around here, so you can't really aim for one to, to navigate yourself. But um, it's a really awesome place to go see. Kayaking is a great way to do it. Um, I love this picture. I handed this little girl this enormous horse conch. They're all over the place out there. And she was pretty appalled by it at first. But uh, you know she'll never forget that experience. I'll never forget it. Watching her face, it was great. But boating is another good way to do it. Geocaching, if you've never done that, that's a blast. Up off of Shell Island Road, um, which is currently closed, but we hope that it'll open um, you know, in the near future. That's where we launch our boat tours and uh, some of our kayak tours and rentals. There are tons of geocaches out there, um, which is when you you go to a website uh, that lists all the geocaching and you put a GPS coordinate into your little GPS unit or your phone even, and you go try to find these little boxes and capsules that are hidden throughout the estuary. A lot of them have like little notepads in there where you can write your name and a lot of people leave a token like a poker chip or a little army man or whatever your signature is. Great way to uh, get out there. A good excuse for exploring new areas. I have a lot of fun doing that. Hiking, there's places you can hike. Rookery Bay's got a, uh, you know, off of Shell Island Road, there's a couple of trails. Um, there's the Snail Trail at the Learning Center there, which is really great to explore. Fishing is awesome if you're an angler. Um, this is one of the best places to do it. Camping, I love camping in the 10,000 Islands. You can camp on Key Waden, um, and you can paddle out and be in a place where you won't see any other humans. It is the most peaceful, amazing thing ever. 
So I encourage you to give it a try if you haven't. Um, and birding, of course. Um, I'm sure we have a bunch of bird nerds on here. I'm one of them too. Um, I actually had a painted bunting at my bird feeders a few days ago, so I was very pumped about that. But birding is awesome out in the estuary. And um, the paddling options are tremendous. You could go all over the place out here. You got the whole entire 10,000 islands. And I try to go out for you know three or four days at a time, once a year at least, to go see places I've never seen before. And I don't know that I'll ever cover all this in my lifetime. But um, you know, we have the, the Blackwater River with Collier Seminole here. We got um, you know, Goodland and paddling around there. There's Turner River. Lopez River, all this stuff is insanely beautiful and um, you can get out there and see it firsthand. And now you know a ton more about mangroves, so you'll appreciate it uh, just a little bit more. So are you still not, uh, wait, wait, no, still not comfortable. <laughs> I couldn't see what I said, sorry. Um, you know, people are intimidated by going out into the, the wild areas, um, whether it's wildlife or just navigation you know, you have nerves about you when you do it, which is not always surprising. It's not, it's way less intimidating than you think, but you have the option to hire a guide. Here's the commercial portion of this presentation. Um, that's what we do, right? So there's me right there. I'm out uh, talking about an oyster bed and finding some critters. Uh, we go out there, you know, while, when we relaunch our tours, we're out there every single day. Um, and it's different. You know, people ask me if it gets old, not a chance. It's, it's completely different every single time. And that's what we do. We, we want to give people the opportunity to go experience these areas, see them firsthand, and um, really learn to appreciate them and love them as much as we do. Um, so this is, yeah, that's what we do, right? We do kayak tours, we do boat tours, we do rentals. And like I said earlier, we're the only biologist guided company in Southwest Florida. And uh, we feel pretty comfortable saying that because we are the, bio, we are the science community. A lot of our guides uh, are instructors at FGCU. Um, some of them work at Rookery Bay Reserve. Some of them work at the Conservancy of Southwest Florida. One of our guys just started his own consult environmental consulting company. So we're actively doing stuff in the science community and we're the exclusive eco tour partner of Rookery Bay and the friends of Rookery Bay. So just remember when you come out with us, not only are you having a blast and enjoying it with the rest of us, you're learning from the best and you're supporting the very place that makes this area so unique. And, um, you know, a, a portion of every dollar that we make goes back to support the Rookery Bay Reserve. And I think the most important part, in addition to that, is that you're supporting the science community, especially in a rough time like this. You know, you, you might think, uh, yeah, I'll just go rent a kayak from anybody. But know that when you're renting a kayak from us, a portion of that funds goes to support Rookery Bay, and it goes to pay somebody who's doing science here. So that is just incredibly special to me. And uh, that's why we always say we're not your average eco tour company. We're not a tourist trap. We want to be an entity in this community that can supply you with all the knowledge that you ever want, enjoyable, memorable experiences, and create that relationship with this amazing place that we've spent our lives trying to protect and understand and study. So that's us. And here's some of our guides here um, that have a variety of different backgrounds. Oh, I'm getting some chats. Let me just check on that real quick. Oh, go Rookery Bay. Yes, Sam. All right. And uh, yeah, so on the left here is Nick Roach. He just started his own environmental consulting company uh, called Wetland Consultants. Awesome stuff going on there. Um, he worked for Rookery Bay Reserve for a while, um, has done consulting work. There's Matt Metcalf. He is a herpetologist. He spent a month in the Amazon rainforest catching crazy reptiles and amphibians, and he's an adjunct professor at FGCU. There's Leif Johnson. He's a uh, biologist at the Conservancy of Southwest Florida, and he does a lot of our Shell Island tours. There's Captain Sarah, who you're going to hear from next week. She runs the Sea Turtle Monitoring Program at Rookery Bay. There's Sam Trost taking some photos. Uh, she worked for DEP doing a lot of estuarine ecology and mangrove work um, and is finishing up her master's doing some invasive herpetology and creating ecological models that will help us predict how they're going to use and move the landscape with development and things like that. So really cool work and feel free to ask questions about any of the stuff that we do. I mean, that's kind of why we put together this whole lecture series because we have such a unique uh, group of nerds here that love sharing their stuff with you. So, um, you know, make sure you, you keep the, we're going to update with more presentations in the next few days. We got uh, Ali Smith, um, with um, Audubon Western Everglades, going to talk about some burrowing owl work that she's doing all over the area. Um, and we got a number of other ones coming up that'll be really great. So um, thank you guys so much for joining us. 
Um, it's an honor to be here, able to speak with you about the stuff that I love so much. And, um, you know, while you're, while you're not doing a lot of things in the quarantine, uh, we wanted to provide you some fun and some learning experience. So, um, oh, we got some questions. Great. So feel free to, to do the hand raise or type in the chat. Um, so what's the impact of Australian pine on mangroves? So oh, that's an interesting one. Australian pines, for those of you who aren't familiar, are exotic invasives. Um, I believe they were brought here because they make great shade trees for the beach. Unfortunately, they're really bad in a lot of other ways. Um, so they're pretty prolific in their reproduction. They don't have a really strong foothold and they fall over easy. They shade out the understory and um, they create just a mess on the coast. So where you have areas of Australian pine, that would probably crowd out uh, a lot of the native vegetation, including mangroves. It'll uh, destabilize the coast and uh, it makes it really tough for sea turtles to get up on the beach and nest. When I was a sea turtle monitoring guy uh, at Rookery Bay, I, I had a stranding once because a sea turtle got stuck in dead Australian pines um, and didn't make it, which is really sad and unfortunate. But uh, that's some of the negative impacts of exotic species. Um, so we, you know, in the reserve, we manage for exotic species the best we can. Um, prescribed fires are great for that. Um, we do manual removal, all kinds of stuff like that to kind of keep the ecosystem as healthy as possible, um, you know, to keep those exotics out. Uh, we got one from Mary here. Do black mangroves produce sets of leaves? So um, black mangroves have that smaller pointy leaf. Um, and I'm, I'm not quite sure what you mean by sets of leaves. Um, I don't know if you mean that if they're across from each other or alternating like that. Um, but uh, the black mangroves, they do produce all kinds of leaves. Um, and I've seen some after the hurricane. This is kind of neat. A lot of the branches got torn off of black mangroves. And I saw little new branches coming right out of the trunk uh, for the last two years, which is really cool. Um, oh, the pneumatophores. Yeah, yeah, so black mangroves, yeah, they have pneumatophores, but those pneumatophores don't grow leaves on them. They're just little um, little sticks. So yeah, they'll never get leaves. Um, and they look really spiky and sharp. They're not, they're actually very soft. It's kind of like carrot consistency or even a little flimsier. Um, but uh, yeah, so when you see pneumatophores, you'll know it's a pneumatophore because one, it doesn't have leaves. And usually you'll see them around the base of black or white mangroves. The black ones are the most iconic um, in that they're long and skinny and slender. Um, okay, let's see. Oh, we got some more. Nice. You guys are great with all these questions. Okay, which is the least tolerant of salt water? Is it the white needs drier soil? So that's an interesting question because although the mangroves are salt tolerant, they don't require salt. Mangroves will grow in fresh water. They're just able to deal with the salt. So um, usually along the coast, these, remember we talked about a niche, right? Or the role that, uh, that a critter or plant plays and how it survives. So when you're riding in the estuary, even on our kayak trips, the majority of what you're gonna see is red mangroves. And uh, they're the fringe species, we call them. They grow along the edges. One, because they like the most water, um, and two, because they're more stable than the rest. And when you move back into a well-developed mangrove forest, usually after that, you'll find the black mangroves. And then beyond that, you'll find the white mangroves. So going from the water back, you'll get red, white, black. Now, that's not chiseled in stone. So uh, it's not necessarily going to be like that every single time. You'll find whites and blacks on the edges too. But that's kind of a function um, of water and the amount of time they like to have their feet wet and also how the propagules are structured and how they deal with salinity. So um, what happens is the red mangroves are the pioneers. They set the, the framework for the rest. And as they accumulate land and sediment over time, if you noticed, actually, maybe I can go back to that because it's pretty close. Um, the different shapes of the mangrove propagules. Come on, almost there. Okay, right here. So if you see the different shapes of the mangrove propagules here, the red mangrove isn't huge, right? It's about 12 inches long. The black mangrove is a little smaller. The white mangroves are even smaller than that. So as the tide is pushing in and out of the red mangrove roots, 
those white and black mangroves can meander through the crazy roots of the red mangroves and eventually take root somewhere back behind them. Now what happens is the tide will come in, it'll flood the forest, and then it'll go back out again, right? Sometimes that'll leave these pools um, back in the mangrove forest. And as you have these pools, the sun is evaporating water, right? So that will make the water hyper saline or super salty. The black mangroves, they don't even care. They're great at that. Um, so they can easily survive in hyper saline water. Um, doesn't make a difference to them. And then the white mangroves are typically back behind them. Uh, and that's a function of, you know, how long they like to have their feet wet. Reds being the most wet, then blacks, then whites. A little bit higher, a little bit drier, but still very wet. Um, the next closest thing, which is not a mangrove, is the buttonwood. And you would find that back behind the white mangroves on a little bit higher, a little bit drier um, land there. And, and they don't, they're not viviparous. They produce seeds. Um, and that's why they're not characterized as a mangrove. Um, let's see. Oh, Deborah, with the questions. You're awesome. Oh, we got two at the same time. All right, let me see. Um, I hope that answered your question. So uh, sea level rise, long-term worries. And then we got have the mangroves recovered around Goodland since the hurricane. Okay, so I'll do um, the hurricane first. So Irma, obviously, was an extreme event, direct hit, huge storm, and it just ravaged the coastline. Um, when I went out two days after the storm, and it was quite a sight to see. It was just completely trashed, and there were no leaves on the trees, totally defoliated which was kind of awkward. They were all naked, you know, so <laughs> it's very strange. But um, since then, you know, they're very resilient trees. They've been around way longer than us and they've been dealing with hurricanes for that amount of time. So you can imagine that they're really good at both dealing with hurricanes and recovering from them. Um, one thing that happened, I know you mentioned Goodland there, Mary. Um, Goodland did have some significant mangrove die-offs. And what I've heard, uh, don't quote me, but what I've heard is um, what they're thinking is that when the storm came in, it moved a ton of sediment back up into the mangrove forest. So um, that sediment put those pneumatophores underneath and it suffocated the trees. So when you're driving around in your boat near Goodland, you'll see big mangrove die-offs, not right on the edge, but kind of back in the forest. So remember we said black mangroves are typically behind the reds. If the pneumatophores got buried, they don't have a way to, to respirate. So, um, so that is what I believe to be the reason that they died off. And I haven't been down there recently to check it out, um, but we can look into that a little more. You can shoot us an email at info at risingtidefl.com, and I'd be happy to, to reach out and get some more accurate information um, on the status of those and what kind of monitoring is going on and things like that. But from what I've seen, um, the mangroves are doing pretty well. Red mangroves, um, uh, in one of our tunnels, we had a really dark shaded area that the roof got blown off in the hurricane. A lot of trees went down and there were little mangroves on the edges, babies, um, that we would see all the time. And mangroves are very, especially red mangroves need a lot of sunlight. So you could have a little mangrove that's really old. It just hasn't grown much because it doesn't have enough sun when the hurricane came through and blew that canopy off and knocked down some of the older trees, um, I've seen those little babies triple in size in the last two years. They're just blowing up right now. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if in the next 15 years, it looks just like it did um, because that's kind of how it renews itself. You know, the babies were there ready to go. As soon as the older ones went away, now they're kind of rising to the occasion and, and taking their place in the estuary, which is a really cool process to witness. Um, so the next question is sea level rise on mangroves. We touched on this a little bit on Discover Rookery Bay. So the question is, uh, the impacts of sea level rise on mangroves and long-term worries. Um, so, you know, plant communities and animals are going to adapt as things change and we hope that they can adapt fast enough. That's really the worry that they won't be able to, um, what we're seeing in mangroves currently is that they're being found in places where they have not been found in the past. So, you know, uh, as you get these king tides and, and seawater pushing up back further into, um, you know, into the estuary and even beyond sometimes, it can carry saplings of the mangroves further in. So in areas where you have salt marsh, 
Um, we're starting to see mangroves colonize those areas because they now have access because of these super tides that we get once in a while. They'll carry those saplings in and they'll start to take root. We're also uh, starting to see some evidence of mangroves migrating a little farther north. Um, and that's a function of temperature. And if there's ever a coastal frost, they're not going to make it. So in areas where they may have had coastal frost before and haven't in a very long time, that might give a mangrove an opportunity to grow and thrive there. So we're seeing mangroves not only be pushed inland, but north as well. Um, so mangroves, as a result of, of climate change and sea level rise, are, are expanding, uh, which is kind of interesting. So you know it has different impacts on all kinds of different things, and, and that's kind of the evidence that we're seeing as of right now. Um, awesome questions, guys. Thank you so much for, for asking. I love uh, participation. And I often say on our tours that participation is required, and everyone should remember that I know the way back, and they don't. <laughs> so they must ask questions or we will leave them out there. And I'm just kidding. We've never left anyone out there. Um, I'm just trying to get through to where we were, see if there was anything else after this. But feel free to submit more questions. Um, yes, yes, Eric, there is a chance to view it. We have that presentation up on our, uh, oh, sorry, let's see. Actually, maybe I can get out of here and go back to the main slide. Let me see here. I'll show you exactly where to get it. We have Discover Rookery Bay posted currently on our YouTube channel, and it is also posted on the event page on our Facebook page here. So this one, uh, let's see here. So this is part of the RTE Knowledge Board virtual presentation series, um, and there's an event on Facebook. If you say you're attending that event, you'll get all the updates on the presentations coming up and you can register for them just like you did today. Um, and that's where Discover Rookery Bay lives right now. We're going to put it on the main section of our Facebook page and it's also available on the YouTube page and that's where all of them will go. So as we continue putting these out, you'll be able to go back and uh, freshen up on your knowledge of the Rookery Bay, mangroves, and next week we've got turtle time with Sarah. Um, who's going to talk all about sea turtles in the reserve and what's going on. So yeah, plenty of opportunity for, for watching these again later, if you'd like. Um, yup. So thank you for that, Eric. And you feel free. I'll, we'll, we'll hang out a little longer because the questions are coming in. So and thank you guys for doing that. Um, I will uh, give this announcement too. battle of the Bay. We extended it another week for the round of 32. If you see this bracket here, um, this is the, competition you know there's no sports going on right now so we thought we'd add some fun um, to your life and some competition because competition is alive and well in the estuary it's going on every single day and these critters are participating in it as we speak so um, on the risingtidefl.com slash battle you can go look at the profiles for each of these critters get some stats on them um, you can read all about them. We also just posted up our sports cast videos where myself and uh, our guide Matt Metcalf are uh, doing kind of a sports cast to break down the competition, the underdogs, and give you all the info you need on all these critters so that you can make the decision on who will be the grand champion. And remember, every chance, uh, every time you vote in the battle for the Bay, um, you get a, a entry into the raffle to win a boat tour for four, kayak tour for four, kayak rental certificate, and we got all this cool um, gear right here. We're going to have an online store for that pretty soon. We're working on that. But um, update on the competition. This is pretty awesome. Wait, who is the one? Oh, Sea Nettle is currently ahead of uh, Comb Jelly here. Uh, I know Charlie's on here somewhere. He was really rooting for the Swallowtail Kite. Um, polka dotted Batfish is, is doing pretty well against the Tarpon here. So if you're a big Tarpon enthusiast, get your votes in because I think Batfish is going to take it. And in the end, it's going to be vertebrates versus invertebrates for the grand champion, and you can make your decision. Um, so just some fun. But uh, yeah, all right. Well, if, if nobody has any other questions, um, just want to thank you guys for, for joining us. And, um, you know, we appreciate your participation and your, your uh, enthusiasm about learning about your backyard and all the amazing stuff we have here. Make sure to like our page, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Get out on a kayak rental and go see some of these critters for yourself. Um, you know, take a look at the mangroves. They're starting to pop right now. There's propagules all over the place. 
So if you take a look at our how to grow a mangrove um, science project video on YouTube, uh, you could do that. I mean, there's a lot of ways to stay busy uh, during the quarantine and uh, we are doing just that. So um, thank you all again. Really appreciate your time and your willingness to learn and we hope to see you on the water soon. Feel free to submit any more questions or email us at info at risingtidefl.com uh, with any additional stuff. And we will see you next week. Um, have a great rest of your day. Um, now I gotta end this somehow. All right. <laughs> Thanks so much, guys. We'll see you next time. Oh, wait, there's one more chat. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Yes, you can vote online, Deborah. Uh-huh. All right. Thank you, guys.